Have you ever heard of the Schlitz mistake? Well, it's when a company gradually degrades its products step by step until nobody buys it and then the company fails. If you just wanted to know that, you're welcome, but if you stick around, I'll tell you all about the company that it's named after. The Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company. It was an American beer manufacturer from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And while they do sort of exist today, uh, the IP is owned by Pabst Brewing Company. The Schlitz Brewing Company went into debt in the 70s and was sold off in the 80s. So I'm just going to use past tense. Uh, but they were responsible for products like Old Milwaukee and Schlitz Beer. Schlitz beer used to be really famous, and they even had the slogan, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. The company used to be one of America's biggest producers, but for a number of bad decisions, gradually degrading their products step by step, and a disastrous advertisement campaign that finally sunk them, they went into massive debt and are now de facto defunct. So if you want to hear a cathartic story about a business that destroyed itself chasing profits and just sort of assume that their customer base would be too stupid to notice, uh, listen on. So first a bit of backstory. The company was actually started in 1849 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin by a German immigrant named August Krug. At the time, Wisconsin had only just become a US state the year before and was a rapidly growing state. Due to a combination of mineral wealth like lead being discovered in Wisconsin, as well as a large number of upheavals in mainland Europe, uh, especially since the Napoleonic War, Germany had been sort of in a constant state of discord. This led to a large number of German immigrants immigrating to Wisconsin. So many, in fact, that by the mid 19th century, one third of all Wisconsinites were German. Anyway, many of these German immigrants like Krug were somewhat stereotypically expert brewers uh, and also expert cheesemakers, but that's a story for another time. So when they immigrated to Wisconsin, they all started breweries of their own. But anyway, August Krug started a tavern and a brewery in 1849, but he died in 1856. So a bookkeeper that worked for him, a man named Joseph Schlitz, took over management. And then two years later, he married Krug's widow uh, and renamed the brewery to the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company. The Schlitz Brewing Company went on to catch a big break in 1871, uh, sort of. Uh, that's when the great city of Chicago caught fire in an event imaginatively called the Great Chicago Fire and while sadly around 300 people died it was actually amazing for the Wisconsin breweries because Chicago is sort of their main competitor and all of the Chicago based breweries burnt down effectively wiping out the competition. Uh, after this Schlitz saw a massive boom but unfortunately for Joseph Schlitz he didn't get to live much longer for the boom period. Four years later he was on a ship called the SS Schiller traveling to Germany and they ran into some rocks off the course of the Isle of Scilly and sank killing him as well as all the other passengers. So the company was re-inherited by Krug's nephews the Uline brothers though they sort of decided to keep the name as the Schlitz company because apparently Americans had trouble pronouncing Uline because it's spelled a bit like this. But from then on until mid 20th century, Schlitz only grew. In 1902, they became the biggest beer producer in the USA. Uh, they were also the first company in the US to adopt the now standard brown bottle, which prevents sun damage and maintains quality. And while they did have a few stumbles during and after World War One, they, they sort of ran into anti-German sentiment. They really saw a lot of growth and no one really took the top space from them. They faced another problem when slightly after World War I, everyone in the USA went insane and banned all alcohol during Prohibition. They actually started making chocolate milk during that period, as well as an alcohol-free beer called Schlitz Famo. But those were both sort of failures, but Schlitz always sort of knew that Prohibition would never last. They were just sort of doing it to, to keep their equipment going. And in 1933, when Prohibition ended, they were back in the game and even started expanding. However, in the mid-50s, Schlitz would run into the first real trouble they had. In 1953, when the Milwaukee branch of the, okay, this is a bit of a mouthful, the International Union of United Brewery, Flour, Cereal, Soft Drink, and Distillery Workers of America went on strike. The, the, the local branch in Milwaukee went on strike because breweries on the east and west coast were being paid more than them. The strike lasted for over two months, until one of Milwaukee's breweries, Valentine Blatt's Brewing Company, 
broke the deadlock by agreeing to give their workers competitive wage. And that sort of forced all of the other Milwaukee companies into making deals of their own. So Blatt's won't outcompete them. But uh, ironically enough, agreeing to pay your workers a competitive wage was dubbed unethical by the other breweries and Blatt's was actually thrown out, out of the Brewers Association. And if you feel sorry for Schlitz and sort of wonder how they were ever going to pay a competitive wage, I would just like to point out that the year before the strike, Schlitz actually became not just the biggest producer in the United States, but also the world. They set a world record for the most amount of beer produced in a year. I think it was something like 6 million barrels. And they were still the biggest brewery in America as well. So it's not like, it's not like they were too poor to afford it. However, one unexpected consequence of the strike was that it actually allowed a Missouri competitor called Anheuser-Busch, uh, which is still around actually, they make uh, Budweiser, to overtake them. And Anheuser-Busch kind of becomes their main rival. For the next five years, them and Schlitz actually compete with each other back and forth to become America's largest producer. Uh, until 1958, when Anheuser-Busch overtakes them. And after that, Schlitz never becomes America's biggest again. They just sort of remain the second biggest until 1976 when they are overtaken and drop down into fourth. Uh, but this was sort of the end of Schlitz's uncontested golden age. From that point onwards, they would continue chase Anheuser-Busch, doing whatever they could to increase productions and reduce cost, but they would never really manage to do it. Alright, so before I go on to Schlitz's decline, when they start decreasing the quality of their beer, I'm going to bring up the fact that Schlitz really should have seen their decline coming. Because they actually got a bit of a heads up in Hawaii uh, with, with Primo. Um, Primo is slash was a beer brewed in Hawaii. They're still kind of around. And the brand was owned by the then Hawaii Brewing Corporation. And it was bought by Schlitz in 1963 and actually managed to become the foremost beer in all of hawaii they, they continue to trade it under primo but schlitz was calling the shots and because of hawaii's relative isolation it's always struggled with beer um it needs to import a, a lot of the grains as well as the fact that uh, not many people are willing to invest in such an isolated market uh, until the Hawaii Brewing Corporation, originally called the Honolulu Brewing and Malting Company, came around, you only really had the choice of microbreweries, and bottled beers had just travelled very far. Uh, and for people that aren't familiar with beer, that, that can negatively affect the flavour. So when Schlitz bought the company in 1963 and built a new brewery in Aia, um, they quickly became known as the, pr as the premium beer. Uh, capturing about 70% of the entire Hawaiian market. However, despite having a majority of the market share, Schlitz found that it was quite expensive uh, moving everything around. So in 1971, they decided to cut costs shipping in dried wort, uh, which is basically the water extracted after the grain's been heated and mashed, and it contains all the sugars that you're going to ferment. But anyway, they sort of stopped brewing locally, and they would do the mashing back in Los Angeles and then ship the, the dried wort over. However, this negatively affected the taste of the beer, and Hawaiians immediately noticed the change in quality, and Primo's market share started dropping very quickly. In 1971, the market share was 70%. By 1975, Primo's market share was only 20%. And Schlitz really began panicking. In 1975, they decided to begin domestic production again, but by then everyone had sort of moved on to Hawaii's growing microbrewery scene, and Schlitz never managed to regain the market that they had lost. Now this example of cost cutting and reducing quality should have been a massive warning about the dangers of trying too hard to cut costs. But a year later, in 1976, the main Schlitz parent company would face similar problems for similar reasons. Uh, Hawaii was sort of a year into the future. Anyway, back in the main story, the problems really began for Schlitz in 1967. While still America's second biggest brewer, Schlitz was falling behind rival Anheuser-Busch in beer production, so the then company president, Robert Uline Jr., who was the great-grandson of the Uline brother, Augustus Uline, decided that if he couldn't outproduce Anheuser-Busch, he could at least make sure that the stuff that he was producing was more cost-efficient. So it's at this point, Schlitz fell into what is now known as the Schlitz mistake and made a number of s small step-by-step -step decisions to reduce the cost of production. Step one, 
he switched out the barley and the sugar that came from it for cheaper corn syrup. Step two, he started switching out some of the other ingredients for cheaper alternatives. Step three, uh, he used a process called heat fermentation rather than the traditional fermentation method because it sped up the fermentation process. But as a result, something called hazing happened, which is when the yeast clumps together because it doesn't have time to filter out the protein properly. And it sort of creates these small floating blobs of yeast. So they added step four, which was adding silica gel, which sort of bonded to it and prevented that clumping together. So it didn't haze anymore. And while successful in reducing the cost of the ingredients, as well as cutting the fermentation time in half, drinkers began to notice the dipping quality after each step. And after each step became very skeptical towards the Schlitz brand. In fact, in 1976, when Schlitz tried to introduce a new beer called Schlitz Light, despite the calorie light industry actually booming with everyone else like Miller Light making their new beers, uh, nobody wanted to buy Schlitz Light, despite it being a boom industry and it sort of failed and it was sort of an indication that by that time people didn't trust Schlitz anymore. In 1976 Schlitz made one final disastrous step with their beer so at the time they were worried that new government guidelines would force them to include all the ingredients including the artificial chemicals that they were using on the label for their beer so they decided to instead switch to an anti-hazing agent that would be filtered out during production so they wouldn't have to list it uh, and this anti-hazing agent was known as chill guard now the problem with chill guard it was sort of this step five that ended up destroying them was unknowns to them even though they were filtering it out it actually sort of made the hazing process worse it didn't work as well as a silica gel and it caused the beer to have sort of a snot like consistency and this sort of proved to be the final straw as despite that the company loudly said that the snot like consistency was harmless people didn't really want to drink it and they had to recall over 10 million bottles of beer costing the company millions as well as causing long-term Schlitz drinkers to just sort of abandon the process uh, abandon the product that was like their jump off point and despite immediately turning around and changing back to create a better product uh, those guys never came back and that's the Schlitz mistake as commenters later pointed out the steps from A to B and from B to C might have been very tiny and unnoticeable but it all sort of added up and the steps of A to M add up to a one big disaster so that's sort of how step by step they degraded the quality of their beer until until it was worthless and people finally left and they never returned uh, however this isn't actually the end of the story because despite the catastrophe schlitz was still technically america's second biggest brewer at the time and it held about 14 percent of the market and they were still producing a lot and they uh, they switched back to higher quality ingredients so there might have been a way to earn the customer's faith back if they played the hands right Now I'm going to talk about the disastrous advertisement campaign that Schlitz brought out. Now, sometimes if you hear or you'll see it reported that it was actually the advertisement campaign that destroyed Schlitz, but by this point, confidence in the brand was already zero. Schlitz began immediate damage control, reversing many of the changes made to their product to increase the quality, but they needed to get the word out. One of the reasons Anhauser Busch was beating them is probably because they actually spent more money on advertisement than Schlitz did. So Schlitz contacted the company, Leo Burnett and Company, for a brand new advertisement advertising campaign to win back all the fans their corner cutting had cost them. Excuse me, sir. We'd like to take away your Schlitz and have you try our beer? Shut up. down, baby. I'll handle this. You want to take away my Schlitz? You want to take away my gusto? <laughs> You're the first person that ever made me laugh. You want to take away my Schlitz? My gusto? <laughs> Say hello to your lunch. Take away my gusto. If you don't have Schlitz, you don't have gusto. You don't have beer. The campaign did not end well. The advertisements featuring tough macho men threatening anyone that would take their Schlitz away, while fitting with Schlitz's slogan, real gusto, were quickly dubbed the drink Schlitz or will kill you adverts uh, by the advertising industry. 
Many people found them quite threatening, confrontational, and scary. And the public's lack of desire to have their face smashed in by a professional boxer led to the advertisements being removed after only 10 weeks. But uh, by then, a lot of the damage had already been done. Th those were on during the Super Bowl, which is very big in America. Those are the ones that people would have seen. The year after that, Schlitz got into more trouble when the federal government brought indictments against Schlitz for illegal marketing. Now that, that's not because they were marketing their product as good and it was actually terrible. By this point they had switched over to a higher quality brand. It was because apparently they were pressuring retail outfits like shops to exclusively stock Schlitz. And this sort of proved to be the final nail in Schlitz's coffin. Uh, whatever was left of their fragile reputation was just gone with this. Despite some rebound af after some better advertising campaigns and again increasing the quality, Schlitz had been overtaken at this point by not just Anheuser Busch but also the Miller Brewing Company uh, as well as the Pabst Brewing Company, dropping from America's second largest beer producer to America's fourth. And by 1981, Schlitz had again failed to maintain competitive wages for their workers. This led to a strike in Milwaukee, but this time due to its failing state, Schlitz wasn't even able to meet the demands of their employees. And a, a year later, in 1982, Schlitz was brought by the company Straw, um, Straw Brewing Company, in a hostile takeover. Uh, they, they fr through these decisions, they managed to go from a company, from a company that originally chose not to negotiate with the strikers, to a company that just couldn't. Um, Ironically, Schlitz by this point was so bad that it even killed the company that brought it, as Straw Brewing Company never recovered from the debt of buying Schlitz. And they quickly found out that by this point, the Schlitz brand was worthless. Nobody trusted it. They all saw it as a cheap beer brand. And in 1999, both Straw and Schlitz were bought by the competing brewery, Paps Brewing Company, which is where it remains till this day. So that's the story of Schlitz, a company that grew from humble beginnings to America's biggest brewing company, only to fall when they started reducing their product's quality in order to increase their income, uh, which is now known as the Schlitz mistake, and the disastrous advertisement campaign that came afterwards that finally killed it. And whilst, while some companies don't really see what Schlitz did wrong, they tend to see it more as the dangers of, of decreasing quality too quickly, so you can still decrease it, but just not very quickly. Or some even feel that Schlitz was doomed no matter what they did. They might as well just cut it all to the bone and see how much they can get before it all, before it all tanks. But even if you feel that way, just remember, if you're a big business, the customers are smarter than you think. They do care about quality, and if you're not prepared to give your customers something worth having, there's always going to be another company out there that's going to take the crown from you if you let your standards drop too low. So that's the end of the video. If you enjoyed this video, I would highly recommend going to thebeerconnoisseur.com. It's where I did a lot of the research for this video. And they've got a very good article on the Schlitz mistake and how Schlitz rose and fell. I would also recommend the website Brookston Beer Bulletin by J.R. Brooks. It has probably the most comprehensive collection of Schlitz advertisements and information. I hope you enjoyed the video uh, and I might have something else up in the future.